Imagine being Mary, right? Mary, the mother of Jesus. Imagine being her. You think she was happy? Like, I don't know. Maybe sometimes, but like, I don't know. Like in the moment when everything was starting to come down, like, do you think she was happy? Like, I don't know. I, I kind of don't think she was very happy. She gets this little messenger, right? This ghost of Christmas present. The very first Christmas of all times, she gets this angel that shows up to her. We see this in uh, Luke chapter one, verse 28. Gabriel, they give him a name. Gabriel appeared to her and said, greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. <laughs> I love this next verse. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean, right? He's like, confused and disturbed. She's like, uh, what in the world is going on here? Conf uh, like, the, if you look up the original languages for that, it means perplexed, agitated or greatly troubled, right? She's like, what in the world? She's confused and disturbed. This angel shows up, shows up. Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. She's confused and disturbed. Mary tried to think, what, what could the angel mean? She's trying to deliberate in her mind, reason, trying to figure out, like, I wouldn't call this happy. Like, I don't think she's like, oh, look, it's an angel. Like, so, so this is so nice. Like, 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 like her world is about to get flipped upside down. And, and the angel goes on to tell her that, that she's gonna conceive a child and that she's gonna give birth to this Messiah. And, and he's telling her all of this stuff and, and saying, saying, yeah, yeah, th this is gonna go. And she knows the implications. And then the angel's like, don't be afraid. It's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> Easier for you to say. You know, I don't know how angels look, right? We put angels on our tree, right? They all look nice. They got like a white dress and they got white wings and they look very beautiful and angelic, like, oh, the pretty angels. Or they're like the little naked baby angels, like you got those two. Um, I don't know. When I read Ezekiel, it talks about angels having like six wings and all of their wings and body and face is covered with eyeballs. Imagine that showing up to you. Just this thing with wings and everything is eyeballs. Don't be afraid. <laughs> No, I think I'm going to be afraid, you know. I think I'm going to need a bathroom really quick. Like, like, come on. Like, don't be afraid with all these eyeballs. This must be unnerving. It's like, don't be afraid. You're going to have a child. It goes on, though, in uh, verse 36. We'll skip down. It says, what's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she's conceived a son now and is now in her sixth month. Now, now just to, to be clear here, this is Elizabeth and Zechariah. Uh, they were too old to have kids, but an angel appeared to them as well, said, I'm gonna give you a kid. This kid was gonna end up being John the Baptist who prepared the way for Jesus. And so, so he's saying, hey, your relative's pregnant also because, verse 37, for nothing is impossible for God. Isn't that great to know that nothing is impossible for God? Like, that is an amazing thing. Whatever problem, whatever difficulty you're facing, nothing is impossible for God. Now, this can also be problematic, right, for people like Mary, who's just trying to live her life, and he's like, you're gonna have a child. Like, nothing is impossible for God. But here, look what Mary says in verse 38. Mary responded, I'm the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. She's probably a little bit relieved that he's gone now. And, and so this angel's there, tells her all this stuff. And you can tell that she's not quite sure about this. You know, it, it seems like knowing that, that her relative, uh, Elizabeth, is pregnant, it kind of comforts her a little bit. She's like, there's somebody else. In fact, she plans a trip. It's like, I'm just gonna go hang out with Elizabeth because nobody else gets what's going on right now. You know, Mary's in a difficult time. Like, like nobody really believes Mary, right? I mean, let's be real. Like, nobody believes Mary. You know, we all believe it now, like, oh, the Virgin Mary, right? But, but imagine being back then, and she's like, she's like, I'm pregnant. And everybody's like, who's the dad? God is the dad. Sure, Mary. <laughs> he might set, say that he is, but, but let me tell you, Mary, it's not God. Tell us who it is. No, I'm not, it's God. And everybody's like, okay, whatever. You're, you're just making stuff up. So she goes, and she lives with Elizabeth for a while. She's in a difficult time, but she gets joy in the present. She gets joyful in the present time. How do we know? How do we know? She wrote a song. Do you know what she wrote a song? She wrote a song called the, the Magnificat. And, and, and this is, comes right after all this happened because see, in your notes, praising God in the middle of a difficult times brings joy. If you can praise God in the middle of a difficult time, she's in the middle of a difficult time. She doesn't know what's gonna be going on in her life right now. She's in a very difficult time. And you know what she does? She writes a song. She writes a song in the middle of this difficult time. Look what it says. Um, in uh, Luke 1, 46 here. Mary responds, oh, how my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl, and from now on, all generations will call me blessed. She has joy. 
She's like, people may not like me now. They may be calling me all kinds of names. They may be saying all kinds of things. They may be thinking all kinds of horrible things about me, but they will one day call me blessed. They will one day see. See, see, maybe you're feeling weak in your own life. Maybe you need some strength in your own life. Mary certainly could use some strength. She, she certainly was in a vulnerable state, but what she'd learned to do is tap into God's joy. It's something that comes from within, and it's something that, that she kind of kickstarts by giving praise to God. See, when life is in chaos, when we need strength, see, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. Do you need a little bit more strength in your life? Do you need some strength to get through the holidays for crying out loud? Like, do you need a little bit of strength in your life? Maybe you need some strength, but the joy of the Lord is your strength. See, in your notes, it says joy gives us the strength that we need. God's joy gives us the strength. You don't have the strength on your own, but God's joy, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And the very first thing she does is she turns around and starts praising God. She, she's joyful in the midst of this difficult situation. Look what it says in Nehemiah 8.10. The last part of the verse says, don't be dejected and sad. How many of us are going around like that? We're just all dejected and sad. Like everything could be, could be going on or everything bad, whatever. We're just dejected and sad. We're just miserable people. But it says, don't be dejected and sad for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Underline that, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So how can you stay joyful when your world is falling apart? How, how can you stay joyful in the middle of sickness? How do you stay joyful when you've gotten a bad diagnosis? How do you stay joyful in a time of crisis? How do you stay joyful when you're unemployed? How do you stay joyful when you're broke? Only by the supernatural joy that the Lord gives you. Only by his joy can we have the strength to get through these things in our life. But you know what? We have an enemy. We have an enemy. The devil goes around trying to steal our joy. He's trying to steal it. And we need to, we need to protect our joy. Do we protect our joy or do we just let the devil steal our joy? See, in your notes, don't let the enemy steal your joy. Don't let the enemy. As we get into this holiday season, we, we put up the, 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 the little plaques and the, and the little you know, cute little things. Oh, comfort and joy and peace and love and all this stuff. And yet, yet we're frazzled, we're burned out, we're frustrated because of all the hustle and bustle. Don't let the devil steal your joy. See, he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He comes to take away that joy. Now, now Mary in the situation, she could have been sad. She could have been upset and bewildered, but instead she chose the path of joy. She chose joy. She chose to, to rejoice in the present situations. In the present, she said, I'm in this situation right now that doesn't look very good. I'm in a situation right now that, that people are saying and thinking all kinds of horrible things about me. I'm in this situation right now, but she chose joy. She chose to rejoice. I mean, I mean, her fiance, Joseph, was just about ready to call off the wedding on account of all this. Surely her, her family was distancing themselves from her. They didn't want to have anything to do with her because of the, the path that she took, but she chose joy in her life. Maybe she remembered the Old Testament. You know, there was another woman in the Old Testament by the name of Hannah, and, and she was in the opposite situation. You know, Mary was just kind of, you know, going along her life, and God's like, here, have a baby. Hannah, on the other side, she was barren. She couldn't have children, but she was praying and asking God to give her a child, and God gave her a child. And, and she had this child. His name was Samuel. She dedicated this child to the Lord. But you know what her first response was? She also wrote a song, and she gave praise to God. And she said very similar things to what Mary said. She says, I'm going to rejoice in this time. I'm going to rejoice because of what God has done. See, it doesn't matter how dark our life gets. It doesn't matter how dark the world gets. It doesn't matter how big our problems are. It doesn't matter the difficulties that we face. God wants to give us joy. This is joy from the inside coming out. See, God wants to give you joy, this joy of the Lord that is our strength. It says in Psalm chapter 30, verse five, for his anger lasts only a moment. You know, that's good to know, right? It's good to know. Like sometimes people are like, I think God's angry at me. Well, maybe so. But it says his anger only lasts for a moment, but his favor lasts for a lifetime. See, God, his favor lasts for a lifetime. And he goes on and says, weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. You know, it doesn't matter how dark it gets. 
We know the sun is going to rise, right? Joy comes with the morning. And whatever darkness you may be going through right now, whatever difficulty, adversity, sickness, disease, whatever you're going through, God is offering each and every one of us. He's offering us joy. We see throughout Scripture that in God's presence, there is joy. When we are aware of God's presence, that he's with us, that he'll never leave us and never forsake us, when we realize that, we can realize that there is joy. In fact, in the Scripture, it says that, that there is a, this Messiah was coming and that he would be called Emmanuel, and Emmanuel means what? God with us. And when God is with us, then we have joy. See, when God came to be with us, he brought us joy, joy for the present, joy even in adversity. This isn't a fickle happiness based on the happenings of life, but something that comes from within. Jesus came to bring us joy. Jesus came to bring us fulfillment. Jesus came to make us whole again. Now, let's be honest, though. Joy isn't something that comes naturally, right? Like when, when, when we go through difficulties in life, what do we gravitate to? We gravitate towards anger and we gravitate towards bitterness and we gravitate towards rage and we gravitate towards frustration. We gravitate towards all of these things and yet God is saying, I want to give you joy. That's one of the fruits of the spirit is joy. He wants to bring us joy. See, sometimes we need to stop looking at the circumstances of life. We need to stop looking at the circumstances, the things that we're going through, and we need to start looking at Jesus instead. See, we need to stop looking at the things that are trying to steal away our joy. Did you know that the things that steal your joy away are not the things that are gonna give it back? You know what I mean by that? Like, think about this. Maybe you got a sickness and that has stolen your joy. You getting healthy will not give you your joy back. You know, maybe, maybe you're, you're alone and you feel loneliness. You being in a relationship will not give you your joy back. Maybe, maybe you're, you're broke right now and, and you don't feel like you have enough money to pay your bills. You getting more money will not bring you your joy back. Maybe you don't have a job right now. You're like, well, if I just had a job, I'd have my joy back. No, the things that steal your joy away are not the things that are going to give you the joy back in your notes. Jesus is the only one who can bring us joy. He's the only one. You getting a new job, a promotion, more money, a different relationship, you know, you, you getting, you know, whatever, healed or whatever, that's not what's going to bring you joy. What's going to bring you joy is Jesus and Jesus alone are your eyes on him. Or are you like Peter who walked on the water for a few moments and then his eyes became distracted by the circumstances of life and he began to sink because he took his eyes off Jesus. Are you aware of God's presence? Because in God's presence, there is joy. Think about the shepherds, right? There's some characters in the Christmas story. If you got a nativity, you usually got a couple of them there, you know, the shepherds and the wise men. You got everybody and the Jesus, you know, number one, they didn't all come at the same time, but who cares? We're just, you know, doing a little nativity scene, right? So you got the little shepherds there and, uh, and, and, and these guys, like, I kind of like the shepherds because they're like, they're like the blue collar guys, right? They're, 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 like, they're like the outsiders because they're, they're on the outside of the city, right? They're, they're not in the city, they're on the outside. They're out in the fields, they're watching their sheep, they're sleeping with the sheep. They're out there, they're away from friends and family. They're, they're getting the job done at all costs. They're sacrificing in order to, to pay the bills, to provide for their family. Kind of reminds me of like a trucker, you know? Like, like, like my granddad was a trucker. And, uh, and, you know, he wasn't home very much. He was always doing long-distance trips, and we, we'd go to see him, and he wasn't there for a lot of holidays and stuff. Why? Because he was out there making America run, right? He was out there doing the work, and that's kind of like what these shepherds were, right? They're just out on the outskirts of town. Nobody really pays them attention. You know, they're just out there doing their thing, and look what happens in Luke chapter 2, verse 8. It says, that night there were shepherds, staying in the fields nearby. So they're out on the outskirts of town. They're guarding the flocks of sheep. And suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of God's glory surrounded them, and they were terrified. Yeah, of course, it's all the eyeballs again, right? And the angel re re reassured them, don't be afraid. It's like, come on, you gotta get a better line than that. You know, don't be afraid. Like, how about, you know, remove some of the eyeballs or something? I don't know. It says, uh, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring what? Great joy to all people. I'm bringing you some good news, and it's going to bring great joy to all people. 
the Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you'll recognize him by this sign. You'll find a baby, perhaps snugly in strips of cloth, laying in a manger. Isn't that cool that he comes to the shepherds? Maybe it's because they knew Jesus was going to be the Lamb of God. He was the good shepherd. And here these angels appear to the shepherds. Say, hey, I've come to bring you news that a Messiah is born. And he's going to bring great joy. You know what those shepherds did? They didn't say, wow, thanks for the information. We'll keep that in mind as we go on. You know, it says they left their flocks and they went and they found him. And they worshiped him. They went. They seized the moment. They had joy for the present. They said, we're leaving our flocks behind and we're going to go and find out what this crazy eyeball guy told us and if it's true or not. And they go because today they're saying, today joy has come. Today it's come. God is giving us joy for today, joy for, for the present, joy for the, for the here and now. There is joy. Joy for your problem, your difficulty that you're facing. Joy for the hardship, joy for the depression, joy for the anxieties and the fears. He said, joy is here now, and it doesn't depend on your situation, and it doesn't depend on your circumstance. You can have this joy now. 